Okay, before I get into this, I just want to say real quick, if you see some strange guy looking in my windows or peeking in my doors, that's my husband. He's photobombing me. <laughs> he likes to do things like that. <laughs> and I didn't even know it. You know, I went back I, when I was uploading, I'm like, what is he doing in this picture? He's just smiling and waving. Okay, that's him. All right. Um... <laughs> Today, before we get into Adam and Eve, I thought it was important to do a video on um, something that you may not have um, ever considered, and that is when we read scripture, we got to have a balance. You know, obviously, not everything that you read in scripture is literal. You know, and then not everything. In, okay, <laughs> we have certain parallels uh, running along in Scripture, okay? You could be, I'll use Jesus as an example. He was telling parables. He's telling a story that may or may not have happened, okay? He's telling a story, but in that story, he's telling a whole different story, okay? And he even reiterates this in uh, chapter... 13 of the book of Matthew when he goes back and explains some of his parables and uh, If we have time uh, in this video, we're going to take a good look at it I'm going to show you what what he's doing here But before we get to that, let's talk about balance What is balance? Um, when you're reading your scriptures, what is balance? Um, first of all, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this and it just I don't know It always just was very upsetting to me I have heard people say the Bible is 95% literal and only 5% metaphor. I've heard this over and over again. If the Bible makes sense when you read it, there is no other sense. Oh, come on. Our God is a spiritual God. We read about mysteries in the Bible. We read about deep truth. How can you just sit here, skim through these pages real quick, and think that you know exactly what's here I mean not everything is literal and some of it is both literal and metaphor but I am going to bring a couple of words to your attention first of all I want to bring the word to you fundamentalism um, a lot of times people are fundamentalists and they will get on these boards and they will oh, fight you with the Bible they call it it's like sword fighting you know, the Bible's their sword. And if you say something that's not literal, the way that they have read something, they'll fight you to the end. You know, you're wrong, you're misinterpreting scripture. Da -da 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 -da. Because they fall in that 95% literal category. I'm here to tell you, that is false. I've heard pastors say it. I think even J. Vernon McGee said it. And it's not true, because I've heard pastors that made that statement cover more than 5% and then try to say, oh, well, this is metaphor, or this is spiritual. And I'm like, dude, you way past, you're already cutting into your 95% literal mark. So, you know, I, I'm just here to tell you, the Bible's both. And it is not 95% and 5%. Okay, so fundamentalism, even if you look it up in a dictionary, fundamentalism is a literal approach to scripture. Okay, everything's literal. Okay, I'm not saying this about all fundamentalists, but there are a lot of fundamentalists out there that do not have the spirit of God in them. And they probably see everything literal. Okay. Anyway, now we know what literal is. Now we're going to look at a word called metaphor. Metaphor, okay. It is a figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable, okay? Now we're going to look at another word, allegory. And this is the main word that I really want to bring up because before we get into Adam and Eve, I'm, I'm telling you, the book of Genesis is loaded in allegory. 
okay? Allegory, a story, poem, or picture, the word pictures, that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typically a moral or political one. Okay, I'm telling you one story, but I really am trying to give you something a little bit more deeper than the story. Isn't that how Jesus spoke when he spoke in parables? You know, one example are the virgins and the oil. I mean, were they sitting there with a bottle of Crisco waiting for um, Jesus to return? Or was that oil symbolic of something else? See, that's what I'm trying to tell you. It's The Bible has, the words have two meanings, okay? They have two meanings, you know? Um, we do this in our everyday language. Um Let's look at a metaphor. Okay, let's look at metaphor. Um, for metaphor, we said it was a figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to what it, which it is not literally applicable. Okay, metaphor. The Bible's loaded in metaphor. I'll give you an example of metaphor. Is when, look at Revelation. It talks about the dragon who uh, came out of the sea. Okay, it's not talking about Puff the Magic Dragon came out of the ocean. Okay, that's not what it's talking about. What it's using is metaphor. Satan, okay. In that case, it was talking about um, a world leader, a satanic world leader. If not Satan himself, the dragon. Okay, and he, was, he came out of the sea of humanity is what it's talking about. So I'm talking about this dragon came out of an ocean. He's saying that he came from the sea of humanity. Okay, that's metaphor. Okay, when you're you're saying one thing, but it means another. Now, um, the example I gave you of Jesus talking in parables is not metaphor. Um, it is allegory. Okay, he's telling you a story, but this story means something else. It's got a deeper truth to it than the literal story. Okay, so that is the difference between metaphor and allegory. The metaphor, you're using words to describe something that have nothing to do with the word in your language. You know, like I said, the sea gave up the dead. You know, it's not talking about the ocean. You know, it's talking about the, when it says sea, it's talking about the sea of humanity. Okay, and there are other words. There's a whole lot of them, and we're going to go through them, and we're going to pick out metaphor out of, uh, we're going to pick out metaphor, we're going to pick out allegory as we go along. Um, in fact, I want to make a list as we're going through our Bible. Like I said, we were going to revisit creation, and we're going to pick out some words that have two meanings, okay? Um, you sort of can say that about the English language yet it's different you know sometimes our words have more than one meaning uh, I could say two two or two you know I could be talking about a number I could be talking about a verb or I could be using it in re replacing the word also um, there's a lot to know when you're reading your Bible it's full of idioms we have idioms in our own language and so a lot of times people will read the Bible and they'll run across an idiom and they'll just think, oh wow, this is weird. This really contradicts things. No, it's an idiom. You know, uh, every language has its own idioms. I know that um, the Spanish, they have their own idioms. Us in English, we have idioms. An example of an idiom. If I have a friend who does theater for a living and I say hey break a leg and they say thank you somebody from another country standing there is gonna think wow that was a very strange thing for her to say it's an idiom I don't mean go bust your leg I mean hey good luck alright those are idioms and um, the Hebrews they had idioms they were their language was loaded in it Another thing that I would like to bring to the front, we've covered covered the literal, 
which would be fundamentalism. We've covered the spiritual, would be, which would be a metaphor and allegory. Okay? Now we're going to cover one more thing called esoteric interpretation. Okay? These are the deep things of God. This is, these are the things that the Lord will show you when it's just you and Him. You know, when you're in your prayer time and you're reading your Bible, and then something just takes on a whole new meaning. It could be a scripture you've looked at a hundred times, and suddenly you just get this deep understanding of it that you never had before. Okay? That is the Lord giving you a deep truth, an esoteric truth. Now, many people hear the word esoteric, and they're like, Get away from me, you know, esoteric. Oh, you're, you're talking about spiritism and, and you know. No, these are deep truths, okay? Now, there are those that are looking for esoteric interpretation, and they are worshiping a different God, okay? They are worshiping Lucifer. You know, the scripture says, uh, Jesus Christ said, you know, that he was the door. He said, um... He says that anybody that climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a, and a robber, okay? There are people that are trying to find deep spiritual truth, and they hate God, okay? They worship a different God. They worship Lucifer. They don't care about Jesus Christ and him being the way. So they're looking for esoteric knowledge, but they are using mysticism to get there. The mystery Babylonian religion. What do you think that they're all doing? They're using mysticism to find the deep hidden things. Okay? We as Christians, we don't go doing those things. We don't involve ourselves in mysticism in order to find deep spiritual things. We go to the Most High and we go to him through Jesus Christ. And it is the Holy Spirit that reveals these things to us. So now we've looked at three different ways of reading our Bible. We look at it literal. We look at it spiritual. And we look at it in an esoteric way. Okay? So those are the three things that I wanted to bring um, out to you as far as balance. Now... You know, I, I attended a Messianic group for a short period of time. And bless their hearts, they were really, really, really wanting to understand some truth. And what they would do is they would only read Torah. Torah was the only thing. They didn't, even, they didn't go past the first five books of the Bible. Okay, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay, they wouldn't go past that. After they got done with Deuteronomy, they were back to Genesis again. And they were doing this because they know that the Jews do this. The rabbis do it, okay? And, um, yes, the rabbis have a lot of esoteric teachings. Um, they, they read and they read and they read. They go over the same five books of the Bible over and over and over again. Okay, but bless their hearts, this group that I belong to, I don't think they understand why um, the Kabbalists, Jews, are reading the Torah over and over and over and over again. It's not because they're looking to see if, you know, when Jacob laid his head on a rock, if maybe they're missing something in that sentence. Okay, these the Kabbalists aren't reading it for that reason. They know that the Torah has been encrypted. Okay? It was encrypted by the Jews. And this was all done intentionally. When you look at the first five books of the Bible, the top layer is the fundamentalist um, approach. You're looking at the first layer. It's all fundamentalist. Okay? It is the literal. But, if you you can't this is now this is something where it takes the spirit of God to truly understand it is to see the spiritual meaning there's a whole nother layer underneath the Torah okay in that encryption then there is an esoteric layer you can't see it with the naked eyes 
You can't. You can sit there, you can examine these pages over and over and over and over again, and you're not going to see it. It's not something that can be read just with the eyes. And so this is why they're reading the Torah over and over and over again. It's not because they're trying to memorize the whole thing, okay? It's because they're trying to see the deep things. The problem is, is the Kabbalah's Jews reject Jesus Christ, so they're going around him. Okay, they're going around him and they are using mysticism in order to understand these deeper truths. You know, Jesus is the way. You know, you can't climb up some other way. You got to go through him. If you're not going through him, he's not going to reveal these truths to you. So if people are seeing these things, how else are they seeing them? They're going another way. Well, this is a very spiritual world and. They are using mysticism and other things are showing them things. Okay, that, I'm just going to go with that one for now. Okay, so that was the other point that I wanted to make. Okay, now the last thing that I want to bring up is this. Before I get into the story of Adam and Eve in the next video, okay, our Bibles, okay, well, my King James Bible has been around. This is not the 1611 edition, but King James came out with the uh, King James in 1611. There were a lot of men, uh, like 30 some men, that put these scriptures together, and there was a deadline. We need this done, okay? Now, when the 1611 Bible came out, it had a whole lot of other books in it that we do not have today. And they decided that these were important books. Uh, they had the Book of Enoch in there. That's like one of the most important books. Okay? And so, anyway, when they put this book together, um, it's been said there were 77 books. I don't know. I've been researching. I'm Seeing that it was more like 85 books but okay we'll even go with the 77 at the time that right after King James died okay they took extra books out of our Bibles I think that the Catholics kept two I know one is the Maccabees I'm thinking the other ones Baruch but anyway they removed all these other books especially Book of Enoch, okay? Now, let me explain something. Now I'm going to go way back, okay? Because somebody didn't want you reading them. Way back, during the time of Eusebius. I know everybody thinks he was such a great man. But Eusebius and a couple others got together and they decided what scriptures were going to be inspired, which ones were not inspired which ones were useless and they I, I guarantee the Vatican has a copy of all of this all of this information I'm sure they didn't destroy everything without the Vatican having their hand in it okay well at the time the Romans okay so anyway what happened is they destroyed something like 300 and some texts okay and they didn't want them in the hands of the people. However, fast forward, 1611, King James comes out with the 1611 King James. Then, another attempt is to destroy books from us reading them in our time because those books were removed. Okay? Now, the point I'm getting to is in the late 1940s, early 1950s, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And it was, it's believed that it was the Essenes, the Essene people that put these away. They put them in bottles, they rolled them up, and they stored them away in a cave. And as these books were uncovered, a lot of the original destroyed stuff, the stuff that Eusebius made sure nobody was ever going to see, okay, the stuff that the Vatican was going to make sure you were never going to see was discovered, okay. I believe that today some of those books are still being 
translate it. All right, there is a website you can go to online, the Nagamati Library, N A G capital H A M M A D I, I believe. I think it's nagamati.org. And um, I'm telling you right now, you could dig through this site. Now, there's a lot of books there, and um, there were different interpreters of these books. But you can find some of the more well-known books, like the Book of Enoch. You can buy the Book of Enoch on eBay, okay? You can buy the Book of Jubilees, okay, on eBay. Or on Amazon, you can buy these books. You can buy the Book of Jasher, okay, online, if you want to buy them, or you have the money to buy them. Um, I've got more. You can buy the Book of Giants. Okay, a lot of people have never even heard of these books. Okay, some of these books, there are different classifications, and I'm going to get into this another time when we start actually looking at them. Uh, some of them are pseudofigra books. Some of them are considered deuterocanical books. And we're going to get into meanings of all this. And some of this is apocrypha. Some of them are just known as ancient writings. Some of them are known as the Acts like the Acts of the Apostles. There are a lot of things that were not included in your Bible today that have been hidden from you. And some of these works really seem to be inspired works. They're even written in the King James. So I have reason to believe that the ones that were written in the King James were the ones that were removed from our original canon. Okay? So I just wanted to make that uh, known to you. The last thing that I'm going to mention real quick is the Targum. Okay? I first learned of the Targum from listening to the, to the Jonathan Kleck channel. Okay? But the Targum, I went online, I searched, I had to have a copy of the Targum because the Targum predates the Bible. It is written sometime around 500 AD, okay, before Jesus. It was written sometime in there at when the Israelites were held in exile, or not in exile, when they were slaves, okay? They had to take on the language of the people. They were not allowed to bring their own traditions and their own language where they went. So anyway, um, the Targum, they memorized their scriptures, and the Targum are those scriptures. When Jesus is talking about the scriptures and he's making references to them in the book of Matthew, he's talking about the Targum. Okay, so what is the Targum and how do you get it? Well, I bought books that said Targum. And when I got them, they were just books about the Targum. Then, when I really got to looking for it, I started realizing they're not put together like a Bible is put together with 66 books. Okay, they're not put together like all the books. you got to buy every single book of the Targum separately. And in every single one of these books that are translated into English, you're going to pay at least $100 for each one. You can't even get the whole Torah together, which is five books. You have to buy each one separately. So you're looking at five, six hundred bucks minimum in order to have just the Torah in the Targum. And there are differences between the Targum and our King James. So that is another thing because there are words left out that leave you to guesswork, but in the Targum, it's explaining things in detail. So I'm like, man, I need a Targum. Well, somebody did us a big favor, and that man, all credit to Zen Garcia. What he did, because he refers to the Targum so much, is he knew that his listening audience is not going to be, probably not in the position to drop five, six hundred dollars on just getting five of the books of the Targum just to complete a Torah. You know, I mean, even me, I really got to think hard about that. So he came out with this, the Targum. Okay, this is the Torah okay and it is the Aramaic and Palestinian Targum these were the languages it was in so Zen Garcia came out with this Targum and you can order it on eBay you can get it at lulu.com you can get it at, at amazon.com okay the thing is is if you get it on eBay 
I don't know about Amazon, but if you get it on uh, Lulu.com, um, do allow one week for the printing of it and then another week to receive it. Okay? And it comes in this format when you order it. So allow two weeks before you start getting antsy. And I know everybody should have one of these. Okay? Everybody should have a copy of this. And um, that's how Zen Garcia, see, <laughs> Zen Garcia felt about it. So, we now have access to a Targon. I would get one before you can't get one. And um, this is a wonderful, wonderful thing to study from. So, again, it looks like this. If you just type in Zen Garcia Targum, um, it'll come up. And... Um, you know, you can order it, like I said, on eBay, Amazon, or Lulu.com. And uh, with that, I'm going to close this session. I just wanted to bring out some um, definitions to you so that as we approach the scriptures, we can see that there's more there than meets the eye. So, in our next session, we are going to read the story of Adam and Eve. Be blessed.